Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. This week, we're here with Courtney Larson. Courtney, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am a PhD student in the entomology department and the ecology and evolutionary biology and behavior program. Nice. And what are you doing in your research right now? So right now I am doing field studies where I look at the insects and other invertebrates that live in streams and how they interact with the environment around them, especially the different microbes and bacteria. Cool. So what types of invertebrates are you really interested in? I'm interested in all of them, but what are really cool are called the shredders. It's a functional group. So it's this group of invertebrates that are taking big pieces of organic matter, so like leaf litter or, you know, it could be even salmon carrion, fish carrion, and they're eating it up and breaking it up into little pieces. So we call them shredders because they, they shred it to pieces. What characteristics does the body of water need to have for you to study it to be a stream? So I look at headwater streams, and headwater streams are those that are really small. They're those first ones that come in a watershed that um, really could be only anywhere from ankle to knee to maybe a little bit farther than your knee deep. So they're very weightable and easy to sample. Is there anything about these types of streams that make it very attractive for these shredders to live in? Absolutely. So these streams are so small that the trees that grow on either side of them shade it, and they don't get a lot of sunlight. And that means that you don't have a lot of photosynthesis uh, happening. That primary production is what we call that part of the ecosystem. So instead of primary production, there's decomposition. And so what they're decomposing are those leaf pieces that fall from the trees on either side of the stream. How does decomposition compare to in a stream versus in a dry environment? So it actually happens a lot faster because in a stream you have a lot of physical um, physical uh, processes that break up that material. And you have a lot of organisms that are specialized to be consuming and breaking up that uh, organic matter. Are these shredders placed in one part of the stream or are they moving along with the stream? So they they normally reside on just a little, on that piece of organic batter that they're eating. Um, They may drift downstream if they come into contact with like some danger like a predator or if the resource gets run out or maybe there's some really big flooding that happens. But most of the time they're just sitting there and... um, chewing up that leaf litter. You said predator. I'm wondering what is the predator for these invertebrates? They could be several things. They could be fish. There's a lot of uh, trout and salmon that are huge predators of these invertebrates. Um, So that's one, one way that a lot of people are familiar with these is through fishing because fish eat these invertebrates and without them we wouldn't have such great fisheries here in Michigan. But they could also be other predator invertebrates uh, like stoneflies or dragonfly larvae. I just realized that we might have some kids listening. Would you be able to define what is an invertebrate for them? So an invertebrate is an organism, an animal that doesn't have a backbone. Instead of having bones like a skeleton that we have, they have an exoskeleton, a hardened outer shell. Is there anywhere here in Michigan that you're doing these studies at or are they across borders? My studies for my dissertation have all been in the lower peninsula of Michigan. I've uh, been in watersheds that are all across that lower peninsula, but especially out in Michigan State University's Kellogg Biological Station, which is down near Kalamazoo. I'm curious, since we're over here in Michigan and water freezes, what do you do when these streams are frozen over? Or since they're running water, do they actually freeze that often? Well, that's uh, funny that you asked that because a lot of my sampling is in the winter when there is a lot of snow and ice, but they don't freeze all the way to the bottom. It has to be really, really cold for that to happen, and it has to be a pretty small stream. And so sometimes we do have to break through a layer of ice at the top of the stream to get our samples, but um, most of the time, even if it's really cold, the streams don't 
breeze all the way. That's really interesting. What's the big question that your research is trying to answer by studying these shredders? So these shredders play such an important ecological role by being a decomposer. And we know that there are lots of different microbes like bacteria and fungi that are also involved in this process, but no one has used new technologies that uh, we can use like sequencing, uh, DNA sequencing, to uh, figure out what those microbes are and if the microbes are interacting with the invertebrates in any way. Could you explain a little bit about this DNA sequencing for kids that might not know what that is? So DNA sequencing We know that each organism has its own unique DNA sequence. And by taking the DNA from something like a leaf pack or an invertebrate gut, we can have it sequenced to determine which organisms are there. And so we can see if maybe these invertebrates are eating certain microbes out of that leaf litter more than other ones and how there might be an interaction happening there. What would happen if you took out these shredders and how would that affect the stream's health? Well, it would really greatly affect the stream's health because we wouldn't have that big chunk of organic matter being broken up into smaller pieces that other organisms rely on for their food. So you have something like a filterer There are a lot of organisms that will filter out particles in the water column, and these smaller particles result from the shredders taking the big piece and making it into litter pieces and being um, kind of messy eaters, we like to say. At the Kellogg Biological Station, you're looking at these different streams that have these shredders. Do you have any ecosystems that you put together in a laboratory to understand the difference between what it is like in a natural setting versus in a laboratory setting? I would love to do that. There are some amazing artificial stream studies out there, but uh, not going to be enough time in my dissertation to complete that. But uh, it's really cool to see some of those artificial stream studies that other people do. And what have been the results of what you found from these shredders? Well, one... Really interesting and new result we've seen is that when you have a resource, let's say a leaf, and it's growing on a tree in right beside the stream, and it fall comes around and that leaf falls off the tree and into the stream. Uh, with it, not only is it all this organic matter, but it's also bringing some bacteria and microbes that are living on it. And so those microbes get transferred into the stream. Then a shredder comes along to eat and break up all of that organic matter, and it actually can integrate some of those new um, new microbes into its gut. And so these new species, these new taxa to the stream, are getting integrated into an invertebrates microbial community as well as biofilm microbial communities that are on the stones downstream. And so it's a cool introduction of new species into a stream each time you have different colonizers of the um, different uh, leaves that are coming into the system. I know that you specifically study streams, but are these shredders and other microorganisms and vertebrates also in large bodies of waters like lakes? Do you guys compare streams to lakes and things like that? So they are present there, but they aren't as important to the whole ecosystem because lakes are a lot bigger, which means they have more sunlight that can come into them. They don't have that big shading effect. And that means that a lot of the um, organisms that are in lakes may be more reliant on that primary production rather than decomposition. Oh, I just want to ask this really one quick question. How many Shredder Ninja Turtle jokes do you get? I haven't heard any. What? Are you kidding? Come on. You're telling me nobody's made any teenage me and Ninja Turtle jokes. Oh, come on. (laughs) All right. Well, that's fine. That's what I was picturing, like, as the little microbe, like, as Shredder, like, cutting up the leaves. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Okay. I don't know how nobody's made this. You you should (laughs) should capitalize on that. Okay. Anyway, you had mentioned that 
during fall that the leaves are falling. But I'm wondering, how do you, how does the microbes compare with the different seasons? For example, in spring, we have flowers, and then summer, it's really hot. Fall, you have the leaves, and then winter, like you said, you're breaking the ice. Like, do you guys compare what's going on within the different seasons and how that affects the microbial community? Absolutely. So there's a huge functional shift throughout the seasons, and a lot of that has to do with the light that's coming in versus the shading, and then whether you have that big annual input of leaves into the stream or whether that's been already been decomposed. And so you see a big shift between the decomposing community and the primary production community, depending on those light levels. And that's why I do a lot of my sampling in the fall and the winter, because that's when the biggest uh, diversity is in the stream. So I get to be, all the people who work in terrestrial systems, they do field seasons in the summer because that's the biggest diversity, all the flowers, like you said, but I get to have fall and winter field seasons when it's really cold. And what about spring, like now with all the pollen in the air? How does the pollen affect all of this? That's a good question. I'm not sure, um, but I would imagine some of that pollen definitely gets input into the stream and would be probably consumed by something. You talked about how you work in the field during the fall and winter. What does the rest of your year look like? The rest of the year... I am processing what I've collected in the fall and the winter in the laboratory, which is a lot of weighing and burning things right now. It's really fun to be in the lab and get to burn off this organic material and play with fire a little bit. And besides playing with fire, what else do you like to do? Well, I really like going to cycling classes with my other grad student friends um, and doing some uh, outreach uh, sometimes with different groups on campus, especially the EEBB, the ecology program. Well, one that I've really enjoyed is biomonitoring citizen science. So that's a little bit of a, a big word, but what that means is citizens, everyday people, not scientists like you and I, but um Anyone, no experience necessary, can come and sample streams for these invertebrates like I've been discussing. And these invertebrates can tell us a lot about the health of the stream. And this is a program that the Ingham County Conservation District puts on. And um, it's been a really fun uh, activity for me to do. How can some of our listeners get involved with such a really interesting project? Well, there are two times a year where sampling and identification occurs. One is just coming up this spring, and another one will be in the fall. And they can go to the Ingham County Conservation District website to see the specifics on the dates and how to sign up. Before your PhD, how did you know that you wanted to get into uh, science? Was it through one of these different citizen science projects, or you just knew that you wanted to do it? So I have a unique but amazing story on how I got into this field because my dad is actually in a similar field. He was trained in limnology and is a scientist. And so growing up, uh, he taught me how to collect and identify different invertebrates and fish and things that live in all of the wonderful Minnesota lakes and uh, rivers and streams. And so uh, he did volunteer work through his professional organization, citizen science type projects. And as a kid, I got to be involved in those. And that's one of the reasons why I've kept up with that and do it still today is because uh, it's been a big part of my life since I was a kid. And I can see the role that it can play in inspiring uh, children to become scientists, but also adults to just appreciate the nature and the natural world around them. That's awesome that citizen science was so influential for you for your career right now. But now I'm curious, what career do you want after your PhD? Do you know that since you seem to have been inspired from such a young age? I'm wondering what is your dream job if you have one? 
Well, I love academic environments, and I'd like to stay um, working in academia because I just love being in an environment where people can uh, learn from each other and really value learning and doing things like this where we can talk to each other about our science and what we're passionate about and learn from each other. So I'd like to stay uh, within academia. What has been your favorite part about being stationed over at the Kellogg Biological Station? Oh, wow, everything. There's too many uh, too many wonderful things about KVS to think of one, but I'll try. Um, one thing, other than the people, not only that are there on a regular basis, but the visitors that they get, because you do get such a wide range of top-notch scientists coming there just to visit, but... One thing I really appreciate is the past scientists who have done research there and visited because, um, for example, I do research out at Augusta Creek, and this is a creek that has been sampled since for, for uh, since the 1960s and the 70s, and some of these studies went on to form really core ecological ideas, really big ideas that I knew about before I came here. And so it's exciting to do research at such a important site to the field and that I can look back and see that legacy of research that's been done there. Thank you so much, Courtney, for taking the time to join us to talk about your research. It's really important to highlight the different projects that are going on here, not only at Michigan State University, but at the different field stations that are scattered throughout our lovely state. Thanks for having me, and go green. Go, go white. white! Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on SciFiles.